Hi students, welcome to Year 11 Biology and Module 4, Ecosystem Dynamics. This is video number 8 and we're going to be looking at rock structure and formation. So what's the context of this particular video? Well, we need to be able to analyse paleontological and geological evidence that can be used to provide evidence of past changes in ecosystems, including but not limited to rock structure and formation. Now those four little words, rock structure and formation, are actually the whole study of geology. Uh, well, not entirely the whole study of geology. <clears throat> but certainly there's an awful lot that we can talk about in rock structure and the layers of different types of rocks, the types of rocks there are, and the information that they can provide to us in terms of the age of different rocks and also the types of environments that may have been around at the time that those particular rocks were formed. So we can't do all of that. That's a little bit too ambitious for one video. So we're going to just try and hit a few little points here, accepting the fact that we're going to have to expand on this in class. Three targets for you to look at then. Firstly, you need to be able to link rock structure and formation to past environments. Hopefully you should be able to draw some conclusions about past environments from specific rock structure and formation and maybe go a little deeper to be able to link um, rock structure and formation uh, as evidence for climate change uh, in Australia and also more, more globally. So the first thing that we need to do then is we need to introduce another ecological principle. And this in this principle, principle number seven, we're going to look at the fact that general patterns in what kinds of species are found in what kinds of environments are to be understood through evolutionary ecology. So here's the key to why these things are actually being brought together. So evolutionary ecology, the changes that occur in ecosystems, particularly those um, abiotic factors that uh, have an impact on the plants, the um, autotrophs that produces in particular, that then drive the rest of the ecosystem, the other organisms that live in that ecosystem, are part of what we need to do in order to uh, understand how things have changed uh, on the earth over time. Charles Lyell said that the present is the key to the past, but really, in this particular video, what we're actually going to do is to switch these two terms around and see if we can find some clues in the past that give us um, some idea of how the present um, has arisen. So what sort of things were happening in the past and how has that led to the environments that we see today and to the different types of organisms that we see occupying them. About 350 odd years ago, Stenos gave us these four important laws around geological evidence. And these are pretty good laws for us to be using when we're analysing uh, rock strata. Um, and different types of information that we're trying to extract from uh, different types of rocks. So the first, and we've talked about this before, is the law of superposition, which basically says oldest layers are at the bottom and the youngest are at the top. So when we see different layers of rock, we know that the law of superposition tells us that whichever ones are at the top will be younger, the ones at the bottom will be lower. And so if we have a sequence, we can do some relative dating of that sequence on the basis of which rocks are above which others. The law of uh, original horizontality basically says that sedimentary strata are deposited horizontally. Now they can tilt bend, fracture, there's all sorts of different tectonic forces, forces within the earth that can actually change the shape um, or even completely fracture layers of rock. But the assumption that we're going to make is that all sedimentary rock is originally laid down flat. Lateral continuity is a law that basically states that substratums of rock will be continuous until something disturbs it. So we um, can expect that in any area that area is predominated by the same type of rock which formed by sediments depositing at a continuous rate unless something changes, unless the conditions change in some way that disturbs that um, deposition. And finally, the law of cross-cutting relationships suggests that in any rock sequence, a layer that crosses or intrudes another is the younger rock. So if we, if we look at a, a sequence of rocks that we can start to pick as being uh, A is the oldest, B is a younger rock, then we see uh, a particular intrusion, for example. This could be um, 
volcanic or plutonic, depending on whether it's below the surface or above the surface. If this is an igneous uh, intrusion, for example, it's cutting across the layers, which make it a dike. If it's going between the layers, uh, that would make it a different type of thing called a sill. But if it's cutting across the layers, then that means that layer C, shall we say, because of the law of cross-cutting relationships, would now be the youngest layer. Of course, if then another layer was deposited on the top, which we would call D, now D is the youngest layer. It's on top, but we don't go D, B, A. What we do is look at the fact that that layer of C that has intruded in through those layers of A and B and the assumption that we're making uh, again, from the last of those laws, is that cross-cutting layer will be younger than A and B, but it'll be older than the layer D, which has been deposited above it. So this just gives you a little bit of a context for how these different um, layers of rock can be interpreted in terms of their relative age. And what we will do is give you a geological time scale. So that's what this is. This is the geological time scale. In some ways, you can consider it the biologist's version of the chemist's periodic table. I don't expect you to memorize all of the information here, but we do expect you to be able to use this table. And it's a really good idea to have a copy of this table, the great, uh, the little one that we've looked at in class is the bookmark. Um, and the Australian um, Geological Organization uh, produced some fantastic material. And, um, and so having one of these sitting somewhere, when you're looking at... Um, rocks and fossils uh, is a really important thing to have so it can continue to sort of um, twig in your mind where we're talking about some of these very important events. You can also see that there's a time scale over on the side here which gives us a little bit of an idea about how old the earth is, how we've separated the earth into different eons, how each eon has been subdivided into eras and then periods and epochs and so on and of course there's there's subgroups for all of these. Probably one of the most important things uh, when you're looking at a table like this is to pick out the bits that you already know. Um, a, a fairly successful franchise of films has made uh, one of these periods very popular, despite the fact that a lot of the organisms that are a part of Jurassic Park are more Cretaceous organisms rather than Jurassic. But let's not let the truth get in the way of a great story. Uh, but one of the things that we do want to do is to start to look at this geological time scale, younger rocks towards the top, older ones towards the bottom. And, and we just don't find uh, anywhere on the earth. With, closest is probably the Grand Canyon, where we have the whole sequence of rocks from the oldest right up to the present day. It just doesn't happen. So we have to build tables like this from looking at information, from correlation, um, from biostratigraphy, comparing the different fossils in different locations to get um, to make conclusions about similarities in, in rock type and in age. So the geological time scale is something that we'll refer to a little bit as we go through this next little section of work. So why are we talking about rocks in a biology course? Well, the main reason we're talking about rocks in a biology course is because information from the rocks can be critical in helping our understanding of changes that have occurred uh, to the earth, to the climate, to the atmosphere, and also to the living organisms on the Earth. One of these important ones are the banded iron formations, or sometimes known as red beds. The banded iron formations are uh, iron oxide, and this is uh, a really important indicator of a change in the Earth's atmosphere from an anoxic uh, to an oxic environment. Hopefully you realise that what I'm talking about here is an atmosphere with no oxygen to one with oxygen. Now, immediately two questions should spring to mind. Why is that important and how did it happen? Well, how did it happen is probably the easiest one to answer first. So, so And that goes with um, some of our finds of stromatolites. And stromatolites are a, a beautiful structure. And in Australia, off the west coast of, uh, off the coast of Western Australia, uh, Shark Bay, you still find living stromatolites today. And stromatolites are built by uh, cyanobacteria, blue-green algae. So they're a type of photosynthetic prokaryote. 
And as a result, they um, were able to transform the light energy from the sun, uh, use that in the conversion of inorganic material into organic material. And in that process, they were also able to release oxygen into the atmosphere. And that was a critical step. That critical step, as the oxygen level started to build up, to change, meant there was oxygen available for respiration. It also meant that there was oxygen available for an ozone layer, which meant um, a protection against some of that very damaging ultraviolet radiation. And this was a very important event when we look at the sequence of life on Earth. A couple of other important sites that uh, we'll have a look at in a little bit of detail. The Burgess Shales um, links in with what's often referred to as the Cambrian Explosion. So again, when we talk about each of these things, try and pinpoint them on your geological time scale. Now, the Burgess Shales have a huge diversity of life that we don't see in rocks that are older than um, Cambrian times, in pre-Cambrian times. Pretty much all we see a very simple, very... Um, uh, prokaryotic organisms or very simple soft-bodied organisms, which uh, we have some examples of in um, Ediacara in South Australia. But nowhere near the range or diversity that we see in these Burgess shales uh, of Cambrian age. As we continue through the rocks going uh, younger and younger, we pass through the Messel oil shales, the Soldenhofen uh, region, the La Brea tar pits, um, these are ones in the US and they are basically, I guess, if you put these two together and we talk about mega fauna. The La Brea tar pits is where we had the North American version of the mega fauna. So that's saber-toothed tigers, mammoths, mastodons. Um, interesting when you study the La Brea tar pits and they've withdrawn a huge number of fossils uh, from these. And what we find um, very commonly in the fossils from the La Brea tar pits are the fossils of the hunters, the predators. Uh, they are in, in fact, there's a, there's a wall of dire wolf skulls. Uh, obviously, the, the, um, the attraction of a trapped prey animal um, drew a lot of predators. And obviously, when they went into the tar to try and get the prey, they too uh, became stuck and couldn't get out. Um, so you even see things like the saber-toothed tiger being um, a very impressive skull, very impressive teeth on that one. Um, and it was one of the predators, obviously, around that particular time too, and we know its remains from La Brea. Riversley is one of our own. It's the Queensland, um, very important megafauna site where we've learnt a lot about the type of um, living organisms, um, animals in particular, that were around um, 50 odd thousand years ago and also something um, about how and or why um, they're no longer around today. So these are just a few of the important uh, events that we see um, displayed for us in the fossil record. Obviously what's important is to be able to study these in a little bit more detail rather than do a crash course because it just ends up becoming very long. So I think this is a good introduction just to some of the things that we can um, draw from geology, from the rock formation, from rock structures, and to make conclusions about past environments, both what sort of organisms were living and perhaps even um, significant changes that were occurring to the atmosphere between, say, um, an, an environment which was lacking in oxygen to one which was rich in oxygen. Thanks for watching.